Hey everybody, this is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. Welcome to the Invested Podcast, where we, Danielle and I, my beautiful, wonderful daughter, <laughs> we are What do we do here, Dad? <laughs> well, I was teaching you all about investing. And I think this point in the road, five years down the road, you have learned so much. And we've written a book together about it. I mean, you've really dug in. Yeah. And you're doing your own your own teaching now, which is fantastic. I'm so proud of you for doing that. And thank you. And That's my own, great. I've got such a nice community on the invested practice. And we're so focused on process, which I'm like obsessed with these days as I'm so coming back from oh illness and trying to figure out, trying to like make my life better than it was before. So that's a fun project. Yeah. I mean, we spend so much time teaching how to, how to, this is the thing you do, the steps you choose, right? Here's how you narrow it down from 11,000 companies to one company. And and you're, you're focused on the sort of the prequel, which is yeah. you've got to get the process right. You got to get your head in the right place. You got to get your head and you got to keep it there, which is mm -hmm. a constant practice, a constant process, a constant endeavor that we all need. Uh, expert, professional billionaires all the way to people like me all need to <laughs> have our head right, understand the ups and downs and be able to deal with these ups that we're having, which is like exciting. And maybe euphoria inducing to a level that is a little bit unhealthy all the way to maybe the crash that's going to happen at some point here that everybody is scaremongering us about. And I don't mean scaremongering in a way like it's not true because it's all correct, but um, just in a way where people are going like, oh my God, what's happening? What are we going to do? So I, I know staying it, steady through that is there's the key. Way, it's a way too many people worried about a crash for a crash. It feels like. Right? Almost. Yeah. I know. It's, it's almost like everybody knows. And so that makes me think maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe quote unquote, maybe this time is different. Right. Um, and, and it's there's weird. This old, there's this old saying in wall street, you know, that, that the market climbs a wall of worry. You know, well, I've never heard that before. The market climbs a wall of worry. What does that mean? It means that as it's going up, worrying increases. Oh, you have a wall okay. of worrying that, you know, now it's going to tumble, right? And, and as you climb up the wall, there's only more worries. And there's only more worries. And uh, Buffett really is very clear about this. And that is that um, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is be out of the market. The big mistake. Yeah. And yet there are times when he's out of the market and this is one of them. I will tell you he's that. He's not right out now. of the market. I mean, he's very much in the market, but he's not really buying that much, if that's what you mean. I mean, he's got half of his investing portfolio in cash. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um, and that, that worries me. That's my wall of worry. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. <laughs> I don't care what the rest of the world does, but I care very much what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are doing. <laughs> and Munger's even more hardcore. I mean, he is, hasn't touched anything for several years hey, now. Hey, by the way, I'm so glad you said that. The Daily Journal meeting, which is, War uh, sorry, which is Charlie Munger's annual meeting, so to speak. Like, mm -hmm. it's the one where he talks for two or three hours. That is, you guys, this Wednesday, tomorrow... If you're listening to this one, this podcast comes out um, February 24th at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And Yahoo Finance is going to um, play it live from their website. And I'm sure they'll have a video. So if you missed it, don't worry. I'm sure it's on YouTube or Yahoo Finance. Just Google Daily Journal Charlie Munger 2021. It'll come up. Yep. So um, so that'll be really fun to listen to and hear i'm sure somebody's gonna ask him what he's been doing what he's been buying and i'm sure well he may may or may not talk about it we'll see <laughs> i'm sure he'll have some pithy comments about it right and the fun part of this is he always talks about whatever he wants to talk about yeah it really doesn't matter what somebody asks him he just mm -mm. says what he wants That's it's right. great it's a total stream of consciousness i love it and i mean in the five years or so that i've been aware of all this it has very much started to feel to me like a going to church kind of uh, expedition. Like yeah. we went there in person. 
a few years ago. I don't even remember when that was. Yeah, it's and, um, and then now, obviously, nobody's traveling this year, so we'll all watch it online. But it, it regardless feels like just like even if he doesn't say anything new, which he totally may not, it just feels like the right thing to watch him and listen need, and sort of be there. dip the dip the cloth and dye it a couple times with the master. It's a 96 year old guy who's brilliant. I mean, maybe he's yeah. 97 now. Um, let's take on that point of questions. We are going to take questions today. We are going to take at least two. Um, because they're both really timely and they're both really good questions. So let's let's jump into that. Okie dokie. Now that means I have to pull up the it? file. Okay. While you're getting that, I want to encourage you all to send in questions. We've got a spot um, on the website. Go to, and I hope this is right, you go to okay, investedpodcast.com and it takes you over to the Rule 1 Investing website podcast page and you can leave a question right there just click on it and leave a question and um, we love to take these questions and we want to take more of them as we go probably for the same reason that charlie loves to take them they're fun you guys come up with some things that are, make us think in new and exciting ways and one of the most exciting things that that charlie and warren have taught us is to always challenge your favorite mental bias mm. you know you just be be humble and take a shot at what at the things that you think are absolutely true and there's no question about it those are some of the favorite things to really challenge you know it's like um you may find that you don't have good reasons for thinking what you think it is just something that you were taught or something you assumed right and, and it doesn't and mean that it's wrong. It just means it hasn't been examined, maybe. Right. Examine it. It, it. That's It's one of the most fun things Charlie does. I mean, he says, I love to blow up a mental bias that I have. Yeah. It's like, that's one of my favorite the yeah, quotes so from him. Cool. I think he even said, a year is wasted if I haven't destroyed one of my own best loved ideas. It's and I've been so actually powerful. thinking about that lately of like, did I do that last year? Like, I want to make sure I did that. And it's, I think it's so important, you guys, because it's very easy to get religious about our ideas. And by religious, I mean they become dogma. They become an unchallenged view of the world that, oh, this is, this is just true and absolute. And here's the problem with that. And first off, the problem in the, in the rest of the world is that you can't hear somebody with a different idea because they're a heretic. Right. I mean, if you've gotten religious about your own ideas to where it's dogma and it's right and it's truth revealed, then just like any religion, someone who is like, no, that's not the case, you know, uh, that is heretical. It is not just an argument we should have. It is not an argument we're going to have because I can't have that argument. It's it's heresy to think what you just said. That's the biggest horror show that comes out of this kind of thing. This is where fascism comes from. This is where communism comes from. Those become state religions where you can't challenge it without being a heretic and being someone who's evil. So be very careful yes. with that. And in, and a reason I'm pushing that is because <laughs> that's how people get about their stock investments. They who get do you, who religious. Died? Okay. <laughs> oh, my, my analysts do it. They do it. It just, you know, you get to where you have a confirmation bias that's so strong. Confirmation bias means that you are biased to only see the things that confirm your view that Boeing is a wonderful business and you should be buying it. Okay. The only mm -hmm. things you see. So an engine falls off an airplane yesterday or the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It burns and the cowling falls off into somebody's yard. Thank God nobody was hurt. Yeah, that was crazy. And my bias immediately as an, as my, like if I'm an owner of Boeing stock, my, if I have confirmation bias, it is immediately looking for reasons why that doesn't hurt Boeing. Oh, interesting. So the first thing is- My brain immediately goes to, 
oh god that's the worst thing that has ever happened to my company ever and it's all gonna go down in flames just like that engine i have taught you well grasshopper i think i'm just naturally pessimistic you're a natural born (laughs) not not confirmation bias person but uh, it's very easy when you have millions of dollars like very easy when you have your life savings okay it doesn't have to be millions of dollars it could be what you got and that becomes scary, right? It, and you, so you don't want to be wrong. You want to see a classic example of that, which leads us, I think, into our first question. It's what happened to a lot of people with GameStop. And so let's, let's take the question. You, you got it queued up? Yeah, I'll play it. Um, I do think that there can be confirmation bias in both ways. Like, I'm not saying that my automatic thought is necessarily better because... Sometimes you, I think negatively about everything, every possible investment, and that's also not uh, no, that's open fantastic. to new ideas. That's great. No, it's good, good, no, good it's stuff. Not. I love it. Stay with that. <laughs> All right. Let's listen to this <laughs> question from Julie. And by the way, I am loving how many questions from women we've been getting. And it's yeah. just so fantastic to hear women investors. And I'm just, I'm with you. No, and I love no you glass, guys. No glass but, ceiling. There's no glass ceiling. It's just money. Yeah. You okay. you raise you 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 can make as much as you can make. Go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Come on, play the thing. <laughs> Quit laughing at me. Hi, Danielle and Phil. This is Julie, um, calling in from Brooklyn, New York. And my question for you is: I'd love to know how you personally feel about short selling. Um, do you think it's wrong? Do you think it should be illegal? Um, and kind of in the light of, um, you know, what's been going on with GameStop, I guess. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Excellent question. Thanks, mm-hmm. Julie. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, that question came to her after the GameStop stuff. And it's something that we touched on, I think, when we talked about it. But... Um, Yeah, I mean, at the time that was all happening, and I think I said something like this on the podcast even, I just started to think like, what the heck is the point of all of this derivative anything? But I mean, short selling is the most basic, it's not a derivative, but it's the most basic, like, fancy financial thing you can do with stocks, sell something you don't own. So uh, to me, yeah, like, I'm like, if like, if there were a market that cut out all that stuff and all you could do was own a stock of a company Mm -hmm. and even you had to like only you could only like (laughs) not sell it for 24 hours or something you had to hold it or something i would be so in favor of that and the uh you know the argument against it is everybody would leave that market and go to some other market that allowed them to do all the exciting stuff and that would definitely happen i agree but so what? Like, if I were a company, I'd want to be on the much more reliable market. But it's never going to happen. But yeah, I think it'd be great to have a market that didn't have that stuff. What do you think? Yeah, I I think that there's a place for it. Actually, um, it would be right. And, and there's a place for which which one? For like no derivatives, not short. And, you know, you just buy in and hold. Yeah. Which exists in the private markets, right? That's Yeah. And wealthy people can take advantage of that as angel investors, venture capital money. And I would like to see the SEC make that available to the little guy without all of this bloody horror show of going public that requ- you know, it has all this SEC. It's like they big brother you to a point where you don't get to be able to do that. You can't do that as a little guy because you've been big brothered by the SEC who's determined that they, you know so little about how to manage your own money that you'd be easily taken advantage of if it wasn't for the SEC and all the regulations that I mean, they provide. I mean, that's often and been th- literally true. It's sometimes literally true. Um, <laughs> although uh, uh, many times people invest in companies like GameStop where the SEC has full, and you know, they got the whole thing going on and it still goes back bonkers right so yeah but that's exactly what her question is it went bonkers because people short squeezed this insane level 
of short selling that was on that stock. Okay, so let's take it piece by piece. First off, short selling. Let's define it real quick. Okay. You go. Short selling is when you sell a share of stock that you either do or do not own. And the literal process of that makes no sense to me. Oh, that was an excellent definition. That is horrible. That was horrible. <laughs> okay, let me try. You try. Oh, my gosh. All right. Short selling is just borrowing a stock, a public stock. But you don't always broker. have to borrow it. That's the thing. You can short sell stock you do own. Well, you're essentially, oh, you're telling the broker to not sell your stock? Of course he's going to sell your stock. You're going to sell your stock. That's not short selling. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Well, that's because it doesn't there's a exist. Covered, there's such a thing as a covered short sale. Um, no? Not, not that I'm aware of. I mean, maybe there is. So I'm going to get a lot of mail on that one. because. Or maybe there isn't, but I'm pretty sure there is. Don't okay. think so. Continue with your explanation. Okay, so what happens when you there's a short sell is that someone who doesn't own the stock borrows it from the broker and had the broker sell it, and the broker holds the money from the sale. So if you short sell ABC Company, mm -hmm. you borrow the stock from an existing shareholder who's agreed with the broker to take a small interest rate in exchange for lending out the stock. Mm -hmm. All right? And the broker then lends this short seller the stock, and now the short seller has control of the stock, sells the stock, the broker does, and then keeps the money. Yes. Okay, the broker keeps the money. So now the broker has $100 a share waiting. That's not the broker's money. The broker has to get the stock back. The money belongs to the short seller. And mm -hmm. it's just a hedge, or it's, a, it's a insurance policy against the broker not getting the money back. All right, so now the short seller, in order to make money, has to buy the stock at some point in the future at a lower price than what they sold it at. So if they buy mm -hmm. it at $50 because it goes down, then now they've paid $50 per share, they turn the stock back over to the broker and the broker hands them their $100. And they just made $50 on a $50 investment, plus whatever they paid in interest rates to borrow the stock because they're paying, they're paying for that. That's a short sell. Now, what went off the rails is that... Wait, wait, wait. Before we go into that, let me just say that I just Googled it, and there is a covered short, but it's after you do the borrowing. So it's actually like... That's when they use the term covering. So you buy the stock that you've sold short, and that covers your short. There. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Don't be confused by all that, everybody. Okay. No, no, I was, I'm saying I was confused. So you're covering your short. Yeah. That's called covering your short, not a covered short. I guess covered short is what you call it after you did it. But I Wikipedia has an article on naked short selling, which is what made me think that there is a, a different kind of short selling. All right, uh, this involves some research, okay. clearly. I mean, short selling is naked. That's what it is. I know, okay, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. I don't do this. I don't like. I don't like shorty. I don't short. Clearly, I've never shorted a stock in my life. So well, I let don't. me let me just say what happened with GameStop. Okay, that made everything start to go start to go the way it went. Okay, I'm not going to say it went crazy or went bad or went anything. It just went the way it went because what a group of pretty sophisticated investors on Reddit on a website. Uh, uh, Wall Street bets discovered is that there was more stock borrowed and sold short than existed. Let me say yes. that again. Somehow, and I'll explain how, somehow, and this is amazing, let's say a thousand shares are available for people to borrow and sell. That's it. That's the whole pile of stock that's out there that you could possibly borrow. That's all the shares that there are. And those get borrowed all by one guy, okay? Mm -hmm. They get borrowed all by one guy. And then what does the broker do? It's a short sale. So the broker sells the 1,000 shares. And this is where the regulators never, ever sort of figured this out. The broker sells the shares to who? Some 
other person who is now long, oh, I'm going to hold this ever, forever. I'm going to hold GameStop forever. It's a great company. I'm going to hold the stock. They're buying it up. In fact, there's some big players on the board who are buying stock. Now they bought it to hold it. Now their broker says, would you like to, would you like to make a little interest on that while you're holding it? And they go, sure. And now their broker puts up the thousand shares available to be borrowed. Mm -hmm. And somebody borrows all the thousand shares. Now they've borrowed 2,000 shares and there's only a thousand real shares in the world. Mm -hmm. And conceivably that could go on Add, in, add infinitum. And, and you could end up with thousands and thousands of shares that have been borrowed short when there's only a thousand shares out there. Now, this is something that the regulators never put together. Nobody ever really thought about it much. Um, because what happens if someone discovers, as Wall Street bets did, particularly these one, one or two guys, that there's this impossible number of shares short sold, if you start buying the stock up and there is no stock to borrow, there's no stock to buy. If you just keep buying it and you get all your friends to buy it too and they just keep buying it and buying it and buying it, what's going to happen to the price? It's going to go gonna up. It's going to go crazy up. Crazy up because there's, there's pretty soon no sellers. If you got this group of guys who are like, buy it and hold it, we're going to drive these guys crazy. Pretty soon you have no sellers. You've got that whole bunch of big buyers that bought the stock from the short sellers in the first place. They're sitting on it because they're on the board of directors for GameStop, let's just say. And then you got all these little guys who are colluding on Reddit to buy up They didn't everything. collude. Let's not use that word. Okay, that's a I don't legal word. That. That's a negative legal word. They didn't collude. They just encouraged. And so all these guys bought it. And now there is no stock to buy. So the stock is going up and up and up and up really fast, right? Um, and so what happens to the short seller is that, he, let's say on GameStop, they shorted it at 40, just to pick a number. And now the stock is being up at 100. 100 and, let's go to 150. Now let's go to 200. At some point, the short seller is in a position where if that stock doesn't come down below 40, if it stays at 200, they will, because they're paying interest on this thing, they will be forced to buy that back at 200 and they will take a huge loss, right? Because right. they got to pay $200 to give the stock back and then they're going to get 40. So they just lost $160 a share. Now, what makes the pressure even worse is that the broker that they're with is looking at the net worth of the short seller. How much money have you got with me right here and where I can see it and get my hands on it in case you can't cover your short position at $200 a share? And the broker is looking at this and going, man, if this keeps going up, this guy who's short will not be able to cover and I will have to cover. Mm -hmm. Now, if the broker isn't paying attention, as they weren't at GameStop, because they have never been in this situation before, it's just a couple of young guys who built this company, they weren't paying attention, but the compliance regulator was paying attention. That's what they do. And they looked over at Ro Robin Hood and they said, uh, guys, if you can't put up, I'm going to ballpark it here, $2 billion dollars to be sure that there's money in your account to cover these short positions if these short positions can't be covered by the hedge funds, we're going to shut you down today. Today. They got that call at five in the morning. And they had to come up with a minimum of $700 million, which they did before the stock market opened. They some, Those guys went out to investors and to their banks and they got everybody a going and they covered like 700, and that brought the requirement by the compliance guys down from, I honestly, I think they're at 3 billion, brought it down to like 1.7 billion that they had to put up, and they gave them some time. They gave them like a day. Mm -hmm. And so these young guys are calling everyone they know and saying, we gotta cover all this. And so people were like, yeah, 
damn, I've always wanted a piece of Robin Hood. This is the first time I could get it. And they started throwing money. And within a matter of just a few hours, they had their $1.7 billion, which was the largest amount of money thrown into a private company, I think number three ever on the planet. And hmm. it's just an amazing thing that these Robin Hood owners came up with and managed to keep themselves from being shut down. Now, part of what they did to cover their butts and not get shut down in agreement with the compliance guys is not just $700, 700 million dollars in initially, is they also agreed to slow down trading on GameStop to prevent it from continuing to go up and put that short position and therefore the broker in a less and less survivable position. And as a result of that decision, then the compliance regulators lowered the amount of money GameStop had to come up with to a point where they, they could do it. They stopped, or they only allowed liquidation of shares. They stopped right. buying. You could only sell. And interactive brokers did the same thing and a number yep. of other brokers yep. as well. And there was this huge controversy that it was all like a conspiracy against the small individual investor who wanted the, to buy the, the brokers stock. were having a conspiracy. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, Robin that's Hood. an that's an idea that's out there, and right. it, it's not that it's that they were, as you just said, they it were was forced to do this in order to literally be able to clear the trades yeah. that were yeah. happening because they did not have enough money in the background. It, it, it Let's do get that back to Julie's question here. Okay, so that was what that do was you a long think thing. about short selling so the first and thing is you, you in general market derivative, but specifically shorting? She asked. All right, so the first thing is that this is the same idea, the same general idea of the idea that you can have more people having a right to something than exists, than yeah. the thing exists, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That idea is, is a nuclear weapon in finance. And that means there are some derivatives which are extremely dangerous, and those same kind of derivatives having more people have access to a thing than it exists, is what caused the financial freeze in 2008. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing, except in this case, it was mortgage bonds that were insured, and then the insurance was replicated multiple times by synthetic insurance. Mm -hmm. And no, the regulators, it's just so sophisticated, and these are, these are smart people who are regulating, it's just they'd never seen it before, and if, I mean, look, I'm learning to drive a race car, okay, and driving a little sport, Boxster, a little slow race car. And I learned all my lessons by finding out, oh, I didn't know that would happen, right? It's like on hindsight, it's pretty obvious. If you drive a wheel off the road, you're going to crash. Yeah. But you don't know that till you, you don't understand how it's going to happen until you actually probably do it. You can theoretically understand it. But that's just the same thing with regulators. If they've never seen it before, it's very hard to regulate. It's hard to think so of it. So what do you think? Should we have shorting or not? Yeah, shorting's very important. Okay. So shorting is very important. And the reason shorting is very important is the same reason that wolves are very important to a caribou herd oh, or to Oh, this an is elk an excellent herd. point. I completely agree with you. Go ahead. I know I, I'm, I'm with so you it's 100%. An, it's an ecology. The market is an ecology of sorts, and it has to have balance. Mm. And, and that means that there have to be, uh, like a caribou herd needs wolves or an elk herd. We live in Jackson Hole. The elk herd does better with wolves. Because much, much better, actually. Much better, it turns out. Much healthier animals. Much healthier. And the you ecosystem have the right number is of them in the ecosystem. And yeah. if you don't have the wolves, what happens is you have a bubble in the food supply. You just, everybody eats. Everybody eats until all the food is gone. And then the bubble pops for the elk and they all starve to death. The entire herd gets wiped out or they get some disease and they all get wiped out. So the, the an, a balanced ecological system in finance in the markets need to have the wolves. And what the wolves do is they ferret out the liars. Mm -hmm. They ferret mm -hmm. out frauds and failures and fads. They look to find the weak. Yep. And they slaughter the weak. Except they're not the weak. They look to find the cheaters and the, the liars. Cheaters. Right. 
and the people who are doing really shady, nasty things to other people. Right. They look for those people. And exactly. I just, you're, I, I, you're so right. And I completely amend what I said earlier. You're so right. We need to have people who are incentivized to do that. It's all about incentives, right? So we need people yeah. who are incentivized to actually do that work because you're right. If we went with my previous idea of like long only happiness, it would just constantly be in an incentive to buy and buy and, and buy. an incentive to cheat nobody is yeah. going to notice yeah, i don't well, have hopefully any you have other ways to notice but yeah i think well, the where the regulators notice... where the regulators fall down is where the the market comes in and steps up because right. there's an incentive to do so there's a huge incentive to do so you get a you, you can make millions of dollars and of course, regulators don't have that incentive. So they're, and they have so much more that they have to regulate that, that look at than just is this company a fraud? Because there's a basic assumption among all regulators that, well, it made it as a public company. The board of directors says it's good and they're responsible as a fiduciary. So as long as that's going on, you know, they're not going to dig. It's just, that's just not what they do. So now we need wolves to dig. Now, here's the problem. These wolves are really smart wolves, some of them. And some of them are willing to take advantage of the bankruptcy courts, which have, the bankruptcy <laughs> here courts we go have with become, the bankruptcy court. yeah. I mean, here it's a deep hole, but let me just say real briefly that the bankruptcy courts, in my opinion, have, be, have become a place where hedge funds uh, can take advantage of the courts trying to keep people employed. Yeah. as their number one priority. And that may have been what was what they were hoping for here in the GameStop situation. Oh, oh, some of them 100% right. Yeah. In other words, what, what Daniel was talking about is that they were hoping by shorting the stock um, to profit from driving the company down to a point where its stock wasn't worth very much and because of the, the publicity that it's a bad company and then have management take refuge in a Chapter 11 filing, which is a bankruptcy. Yeah, and so the, the company funds, can't raise money at that point because their right. stock isn't worth their anything, isn't worth and anything, everybody and has the view news. that it's all bad, and there's right. you know it's a dying company, and and exactly. then they go, hey, here's a way out. And yeah, we'll provide you $90, billion, $90 million of debtor in possession financing. We'll go into court with a prepackaged bankruptcy that says that We've agreed with the lenders that they'll take about you know this much stock in the new company. The shareholders are wiped out. They don't have anything to say about it. And the bankruptcy court trying to keep people employed, let's say at GameStop or any of the many of the other ones that have gone through bankruptcy, their number one priority, let's get them through, let's get it restructured, and let's get it out there and keep these people employed, is that makes it really possible for sneaky hedge funds to steal companies. And they do. They collude. Now, this is colluding with management. Yeah, this is colluding. This is colluding. They get with management and they'll say, okay, when we come out of this bankruptcy, we'll give you guys 10% of the company and and that, and that you'll continue to run it. Not you saying go, that that happened in GameStop, just to be super clear. We right. don't know anything about oh, what I, was going on. I think on. the absolute opposite happened yeah. in GameStop. The board... Yeah. The board is loaded with people now who are really well financed and smart, and they really are putting a lot of effort into bringing GameStop to the next level. Which is, by the way, why the guys on Wall Street Bets started talking about the stock in the first place. Exactly, because they were this new management came in to the board, right, and yeah. saying, "Look, these guys are in it. They're putting like, their own money in it." It's a real. I'm not. Most of the people on there were like fully speculating, but I think there are some people and the ones who started this off. Oh, the um, I think guys? truly believe in in the company, which they is did. really nice to see. And so I what think, I hear you saying yes. is that. You think a market that is uh, healthy needs to have long selling and short selling in order yes. to balance things out. Yes, but the regulators okay. have to prevent leveraged short selling. You can't have more shares short than you have stock. It's an unusual situation yeah. that hedge funds created. And I, I don't have an answer for how you do that, but surely it's doable. And you remove that sort of derivative trade. It's effectively a derivative that. that but what if we only there. had a market that was only long or short, none of the other stuff, like no options trading, full stop, 
only, let's say they even cut it down to like only 50% of the float is allowed to be shorted, something like that to like protect against uh, excessive shorting somehow between multiple brokers. I don't know. And that's it. Like no options, no, uh, I don't know what other derivatives are available to retail investors, but roughly like no options, let's say. And well, then it's certainly the market just that we had. Short. Effectively, we had that market, the whole history of the market until yeah, the 1960s. Yeah, you mentioned that recently, that it was only, I was going to say only a few years ago, but that was actually quite a bit of time ago, um, that they created these derivatives. It, and they just like sort that. of rolled into it because companies that went public often, in order to encourage people to invest in them, effectively gave people an option. They just didn't call it that and there wasn't a market. Right, there was no Chicago Board of Exchange that was managing the option flow or anything else. So, the the uh, the the name of the thing that they had was called a warrant. And often, when you bought stock back in let's say 1940, you got a share and a warrant to buy more. Hmm. Yeah. And that is a call option. Yeah, a warrant. That's true. A, a warrant is a long call. So. Yeah. You get it. You get the right to buy more. Let's say you buy your first chunk at sixty dollars a share, and now you have a warrant to buy more at seventy dollars a share, mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And now you have a right, and there you go. Now, whenever there's this this financial um, uh, entity, which a warrant is, a market's going to open up around it. It's like, oh, you've got it's a really warrant. Really interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. Like, this I'd is like fun to, buy to like. This warrant. is fun to like work this out. Yeah. Um, I'd like to buy your warrant. I'll pay you a dollar for your warrant. Right. Right. Well, See? you could just not allow that, but then that brings into account issues of being able to have your I'm, investments I mean, be really? relatively liquid. I mean, really, you're not going to allow me to sell something I exactly. Own? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. Like that's that's not going to fly. Right. So you um, have to, you will effectively have a call option market. Well, and the other interesting it. part of it is that in high growth startups, warrants and options, which are just exactly like you just described, a call option to buy the stock at a certain price, usually extremely low because you're somebody who came in really early. Right. Those exist past when a company goes public. They're, they're yours. They're your right. Even if a company, you know has soared beyond belief and it's 10 years later, you still have your option from day one that you got as, you know, employee number two. And <laughs> totally right. Like that's something that you, I think would, would devastate the entrepreneurial world if that went away somehow. So uh, if you're bringing that in right. and those still exist, then yeah, it's kind of, but somehow they did it before the sixties then. Maybe they didn't do it. Yeah, that was. I mean, those were what happened. Was they just had the, straight up warrants? Maybe. Well, yeah, they had straight up warrants, and they were traded, but not sophisticated way. Yeah. Then a guy named Ed Thorpe, who we've talked about here before, the same guy that wrote the the book on how to how to beat the the dealer in twenty one in blackjack. That guy was a math professor at University of California, Irvine, and he basically figured out what later became known as the Black-Scholes formula. Oh, do you know what? I'm listening to his book oh, his right book now, good. and I'm only at the part where he just figured out I almost don't want you Blackjack. to tell anybody what the name of this book is. I <laughs> almost don't want... Because it is such an edge for our trading, honest to God, the stuff you learn in that book gives you an oh. edge. Oh, I haven't learned it yet. That's what I'm saying. I just got, this is why I don't know what you just said. All right, I, we're not gonna, not gonna tell you the name of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I've only gotten to the part where he just beat Blackjack. When you're done reading it, we'll talk about this book. But right now, everyone it's forget what I said. such a secret. If we never tell you, you'll never find out. You'll never out. figure out Ed Thorpe's book. All right, that, that gives you a but little homework. I'm listening to it because I have a hard time reading these days and... I just discovered that that's a book I can actually listen to and like it's, comprehend, which is really nice for me coming back with. Cool. Yeah, so it's been interesting. It's but that's why I'm so that's why I'm so slow with it. Story. It's a great story. It involves mobsters, the yeah. Wall Street. It's just everything. 
<laughs> so here's here, but here's the punchline: is that Thorpe invented what's now known as the Black Scholes formula, and he just wrote a paper on it. He didn't pursue fame because he was pursuing fortune, using that formula when no one else had it to price out warrants, effectively how to price an option. And he made such a killing. He he made 28% a year for, I don't know, 20-some years. It's just compounding wow. money like a maniac. And, well, I haven't uh, gotten to that part of the book yet, but what I have learned, just to bring this conversation full circle to the very beginning. To our one question today. Well, actually, we I wasn't even going to bring it to Julie's question. I oh was just going to say to the all the way to the beginning to the practice of investing. Hmm. I learned already from him a couple of things about how to better my practice. Because as you just said, he's not like a financial dude. Like he's a mathematician academic. He's not right. one of these Wall Streeters, you know, and it's right. it's like a hundred percent not his game. He right. sort of looks at them like like total aliens. Right. And when he goes to Vegas to figure out the blackjack and actually um, see if his method works, he intentionally, first of all, only uses a small bankroll, even though the mobster who tries to get him to um, to to beat the blackjack game for him and like I assume pay him a cut, although they didn't explain that exactly. Uh, it tries to give him like $100,000, which at that right. time was probably what, like $2 million or something? Sorry, at that time was 100000 Now would be <laughs> a, a lot. lot. A lot. Um, and he says, no, I'm only going to take 10000 Like not a penny more than 10000 That's our limit because that's an amount that he like felt okay with maybe losing because he knew there was a strong possibility he would lose. And... I just I just heard that and I was like, yes, that is the most perfect investing practice. Right. Mark, where you're you're new, you don't really know what you don't know, you're trying something out, stay small, stay comfortable. And he explicitly so, says in the book, it's it was to make sure that he didn't get too emotional about it. So he didn't right. want to be there and be scared of losing this guy's money. And it's just, it was just perfect. So That's fabulous. so right on. I, I mean, yeah. that's just so right on. All right, so okay. a little, we, we need to wrap up on, on our short selling question. So I don't know if we want to take this deeper. It's a, it's a deep hole. But the essence of it is that short selling, I think, is necessary in the market to keep the markets honest. Those guys bring to light the frauds and um, have been very, very successful at finding out fraudulent Chinese companies, for example, recently. Um, and they, you know, there, there can be a battle between a short seller and a long seller, and there have been some famous ones that we could talk about, where both sides are very rational and both sides have very good reasons for why they're doing what they're doing. It's not 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 a game, mm -hmm. right? They're not trying mm -hmm. to hammer some. That can happen in short selling. Now, yep. we can talk more about GameStop, about what happened there. Um, we've talked a little bit about Robinhood, which uh, we, we can talk about more next time too. So let's let's do that. Let's let's yeah. Next time we're going to talk about Daily Journal, but maybe it'll bring in oh, a lot of these yeah, themes right. because I'm pretty sure people are going to ask Charlie Munger about this stuff. Okay, so very good. And Charlie just probably will say it's just gambling and stupid. Oh, definitely. I don't know what he's going to say. <laughs> but but let's let's do this. Okay, so everybody, on your, if you're tracking where we're going to go, we're doing Daily Journal next time, which could easily take up the whole podcast. It could, it could take two podcasts. So let's not yeah. predict past that, but I think we will be talking about these themes and we, we do want to talk about, about this more. how these brokerages uh, messed up. Because we haven't gotten to the reason for put options yet. And those haven't okay. been around as long I'll as tell you what, options. I'll even write it down. Okay, but we're very going good. too long. Very good. Here we go. We will we will move on now to uh, to next week and you guys have a good one. Time to go play. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Bye. See ya. Hi guys, thanks for listening to Invested. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more information or to listen to additional episodes, visit our website at investedpodcast.com and sign up for my virtual workshop right there. Spots are definitely limited for this event. I'm not kidding, they really are. They sell out very quickly. So everything discussed on this podcast, by the way, is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion. And it's really important, it's not to be taken as investing advice because I am not your financial advisor 
nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. So remember that. You're on your own here. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I really hope you enjoyed it.